Ah, uh, yes. It is the weekend. And recently, you guys have helped me reach 600 subscribers. I didn't think I would even reach this number by the end of the month, and it's still not even the end of the month yet. So, thank you so much. And also, I wanted to thank you all for all of these wonderful comments in there. And even if your comment isn't in there, I'm still appreciative of it. Thank you so much. And with that said, let's jump into the video. I'll assume you all know about the Deep Whip. Well, what you've heard is true. It's not a great place. While some people are there to score weed, or firearms, or even out of sheer curiosity, others, well, they're obviously not up to anything good. But I'm not here to talk about those sickos. I'm here to talk about what lies beyond that point. The more cryptic and unexplainable part of the internet. The part that nobody's really supposed to see. There was an infographic that cropped up a while ago, not sure when. The eight levels of the internet. Maybe you've seen it. As interesting as it was, it's completely bunk. I'm sorry, but not polymeric fascicle derivation means nothing. And the Pyramarch system? I guess somebody's a fan of Warhammer. No, there's no quantum mechanics involved here. However, that doesn't mean it was an easy place to find. Now, I'm not going to begin to tell you how to get there. It's unlikely that you'd be able to, even if I did. I'm not tooting my own horn here. I just didn't have a life outside of this. I was warned, of course. Everybody told me I wasn't going to like what I saw. That I wouldn't even understand it. Now, I'm passing off that warning to you. Don't try to look for this. There's no official name for this page. Or at least, I haven't seen one. There were rumors, however. These range from an Illuminati chat room to a virtual holding cell for an experimental AI gone rogue. In reality, it's a lot worse. After a long, painful process of breaking down firewalls, encryptions, and solving bizarre philosophical riddles, the following hidden links I was finally directed to a blank page, and one line of text in the text box underneath. Quid quarrels? Latin for what do you seek? I remember feeling surprised, but in retrospect, I didn't know what I was expecting. I'll admit, I was a bit stumped here. Partly because I didn't know the answer to that question. I had no objective. I just wanted to see if I could do it. I tried some generic answers at first. I typed in the truth and enlightenment. You know, matrix shit. Nothing happened. I tried a bunch of answers, but none of them worked. I was getting frustrated at this point. Maybe this was a gag page. Maybe I really hadn't figured anything out. If only. I tried something off the wall, not sure how this came to me, or why I thought it would work, but I typed in, what also seeks me. Now that I think about it, this thing might have been an AI. To my surprise, the page went blank. Like, fully blank. I waited. After about five minutes, I was directed to what looked like a forum. No, not even that. It was more basic. Just a list of links over a brownish-yellow background. The links themselves were indecipherable. Just seemingly random sequences of characters, symbols, and letters. A lot of them I had never even seen before. It almost looked like an alien language. Obviously, just code I didn't understand. At this point, expectations were off the wall. Each link was a shot in the dark. I clicked on the first one. It loaded up a live feed of what seemed to be the Paris catacombs. I watched for a while, but it was ultimately uneventful. I moved on to the next link. It was a shaky video in a dark setting, but I could make out men in tactical gear. 
They were in a house, opening doors and sweeping each room. Eventually, they kicked one down to reveal a creature, tall and humanoid, with scaly skin. It was gnawing on a dismembered arm. They tried to shoot at it, but it escaped out the window. The video stopped there. Well, I was floored. What the hell was this? It looked too real to be unreleased film footage. I was officially intrigued. Maybe this was worth the moments. Maybe this was worth the months of headaches and bloodshot eyes after all. I couldn't stop now. I started working down the list of links. With each click, everything got more and more bizarre, more disturbing. I stumbled upon a document called the Paragon Project. I stumbled upon a document called the Paragon Project, detailing trials of human experimentation that would lead to superhuman levels of strength and durability. It was an apparent success. Looked official, too. There were essays on space-time anomalies, glitches in reality, and apparent pictures of alternate dimensions. There were detailed explanations regarding Area 51, the Bermuda Triangle, assassinations, disappearances, and the true nature of the Holy Grail. One of the more upsetting ones was a document referring to the world-ending bomb. A nuke that's 720,000 times stronger than the one dropped on Hiroshima. I don't want to know why we would need that. I found contingency plans for different kinds of apocalypses, nuclear winter, biological weapons, viral outbreak. Some more peculiar ones were called the Marina's Trench Abnormality and bluntly labeled Strange Man on the 15th floor, and one simply referred to as Blackout. Recovered logs of skinwalker hunting expeditions, 911 transcripts from residents of a town in Texas that went missing in 1977, and even the journals that belonged to the people involved in the Daltov Pass incident. They didn't go insane because of the snow. I spent hours on there. Looking through pages and pages of things I felt I wasn't supposed to see, I came across a trailer to a silent film made back in 1910. One that apparently made people claw their eyes out after watching that nearly derailed the whole industry. There was a live stream of a hooded man sitting in front of a camera, head crouched down. He eventually lifted his head, even though he had no mouth, a deep, guttural, Hello. came through my speakers. Somehow, I knew it came from him. I didn't stick around for that. There were obscure sets of step-by-step -step guides that involved things like cutting off your own limbs and sewing on corpses, performing religious incantations in the middle of the Siberian forest, and going to coordinates that apparently housed captive fallen angels. It was unclear what any of these were supposed to achieve. There was also a 20 second long clip, titled, The Futility of the Living. I didn't watch it. That's when I realized there was no way even the highest form of organized government had full control of this. One of the scariest things about this whole experience was that I didn't find an end to the list, no matter how far I scrolled down. I think I had a meltdown and passed out eventually, because I woke up on my floor in the middle of the night. I looked at my computer screen to see looped helicopter footage of a massive crab-like creature tearing apart a coastal island. I clicked off of it. I just sat there for the longest time. I couldn't comprehend what I was seeing, and I don't think I really wanted to. Now, I'm not really sure why I kept going. My brain was screaming for me to take my computer out to the lawn and smash it into pieces. But I didn't. I noticed something I hadn't before. A small message at the bottom left hand corner of the screen. I don't know if it was always there or not. It was so hard to read so I had to squint. More Latin. Translated into, are you satisfied? There were two options underneath it. Yes and no. Now, I knew the answer to this question. Hell no, I wasn't satisfied. I was horrified, scarred for life, but I shouldn't have clicked on yes. 
If I just clicked on yes, it would have taken me out of that godforsaken place. Back to comfort. Insanity. Even right now, I can't tell you why I clicked on no. But once I did, the page seemed to refresh. It was still, and same basic setup. Except, there were only four links. This time, there were no recognizable numbers or characters. Hell, it didn't look like anything that could have come from this world. Just a collection of extremely crude symbols that didn't give off any sense of pattern or direction. I clicked on the first link. After about 20 seconds, I slammed my computer shut. I can't describe to you what I saw. All I know is that I wasn't supposed to see it. Nobody should ever see something like this. It's not only that it didn't make any sense. I can't tell you why it didn't. I couldn't begin to grasp the images I was seeing. It wasn't graphic or anything, not like that. I just couldn't recognize anything. I could make out things moving, but not in a way any creature on Earth has ever moved before. Colors that I'd never seen before. Just thinking about it gives me a splitting headache. This is my best attempt at visualizing it. We have three dimensions here on Earth. We can move forwards, backwards, left, right, 72.4 degrees southwest, etc. These things weren't restricted to that. I can't explain it any further. All I know is that I didn't want to watch one more second. I don't think I would have been able to. I left my room for the first time in a while. I was planning to leave my house. I needed fresh air. To take a walk or something. Hell, I was thinking about running a marathon in the middle of the night just to get my mind off that shit for a few hours. I was putting on my jacket when I heard a knock at the door. I stopped dead in my tracks. Obviously, I wasn't opening it. About a minute and five more sets of knocks came before someone spoke up. Open up. We know what you did, but we're not here to hurt you. We just want to talk. The tone wasn't threatening. Eventually, I obliged. I opened up my door to two tall, slim men in suits. They smiled at me. Can we come in? I still don't know how they found me. I thought for sure that I was off the grid. We sat down on the couch. I guess I was just waiting for answers at this point. One of them looked at me and said, What were you looking for? I don't know, but I'm not going back, I responded. He smiled again, like this is what he wanted to hear. The other one piped up, Who do you work for? His tone was a bit more aggressive. I just shook my head. Look. I didn't know what I was getting into. I wasn't looking for anything. They just stared at me for a while. I'm not going to tell anybody. Trust me. They finally responded. We're not worried about that. Doubt anybody would believe you. Another smile. Somehow, it felt genuine. We just wanted to know what your priorities were. In retrospect, that was a very strange question. Just do us a favor, and we'll leave. I perked up. Give us the device you use to access it. I didn't ask any questions. I ran upstairs and basically tossed them my laptop. They both smirked at me one last time before heading for the door. Just as they were about to leave, one of them turned back. I don't think you need to be told, but don't try this again. And don't show anybody else how to get there either. We'll know. I didn't ask who they were. I'm not sure I would have wanted to know. It's been a week now. I don't go on the internet so much anymore. After this, I'm going to try and forget. To try and not think about it anymore. I've started having horrific nightmares. Been seeing a therapist for that. But I don't think it's helping. Anyways... I'm not going to let this consume the rest of my life. The thing is, I'm afraid this might not be possible. 
There are some things we aren't supposed to know about. Probably for our own safety and sanity. Don't try and seek them out. It's better that way. However, it might be a bit too late for me. They say that curiosity killed the cat. It's funny. That almost feels like a personal attack at this point. I haven't forgotten about that night. I mean, it's not just something you could stop thinking about. What the hell was that thing I saw? Strange thing is, it never even comes up in my nightmares. It's always the other stuff. I swear, I can see that dude with no mouth every time I close my eyes. But maybe it's not so weird. My brain couldn't comprehend it to the first time. So how could my subconscious reproduce a recreation? Shit. I don't want to think about it anymore. But I can't. You see, my problems aren't just in my head anymore. I thought I was done with this shit after the men in black paid me a visit. I thought it was over. In retrospect, that was just wishful thinking. No, it was delusional. After what I saw, guess it doesn't work like that. I guess the world just isn't that simple. Here's what's been happening. Wednesday. It's been three days since I've gone back to work and I think I'm being followed. No, I'm sure I am. The thing is, the first time, I didn't really notice. Whoever the hell they are, they've been using different vehicles, always the same routine. After work, I get into my car and start driving home. Another vehicle always tails me until I turn into my driveway and they just drive past. Now, if it happens once, whatever, but three times? Under normal circumstances, I could call it a coincidence. For obvious reasons. I can't do that right now. I'm not really sure what the hell they want. Maybe they're trying to monitor me. God, that's all I hope they're trying to do. If that's the case, I'll just lay low and ride it out. Just give them what they want. Thursday. This time, I tried to get a glimpse of them in my rear view. Windows were tinted. Great. Again, I pulled into my driveway, and they kept going. Now, I know I said I was just going to ride it out, but this kind of shit really does take a toll on you. I don't want to deal with whatever the hell this is anymore. I swear they're following closer and closer each time. Friday. I did something different today. Took public transit instead of driving. I've never needed a drink more in my life. So I went to a bar after work. I guess this was more of an experiment to see how closely they had been tracking me. If they're bothered by the waiting, then they can go fuck themselves. I'm still living my life. Although, I couldn't keep my eyes off the windows the whole time I was in there. After getting sufficiently wasted, I flagged a cab down. And surprise, surprise, there they were, right behind us. But here's what I didn't expect. It was the same car from yesterday. Looks like they gave up the incognito act. Not sure how to feel about that. Damn it. Something else has changed. They didn't just keep driving this time. After the cab dropped me off, I turned around to see the damn car parked. Half a block away from my house. I just went inside. The hell was I supposed to do? Calling the cops didn't even occur to me, but to be honest, I don't think that would have helped. It's been three hours now, and they're still there. I haven't been watching them the whole time, so I don't know whether or not they're actually in the car. Not fun to think about it. There's no way in hell I'm sleeping tonight. It's about 2 a.m. I just got a text message, private number, and here's what it said. Leave your house. Don't use the front door. They're still there. Come to the all-night diner, about five blocks away. 
Don't think about driving. They'll know. Be quick. They're coming in soon. Don't get followed and leave your lights on. I froze after reading this. They, they're coming in? For what? Who the hell's texting me? Now, I don't know what you would have done in this situation, but I took the warning. I was paranoid as hell at this point. Buzzed and tired, I put on a jacket and went out my back door. I also took a backpack with my other laptop in it. Not sure why, but I felt like I needed to. I waited for a second before I climbed my own fence. When I was sure nobody had noticed, I started heading towards the diner. After about 40 minutes, I finally got there. Would have been shorter, but I pretty much ducked into the bushes every time a car passed. I scanned the patrons. A table of drunk college kids, a few truckers, and a dude in a hoodie typing away on his computer in the back. He didn't look threatening. Although, he was pretty scrawny. I made an educated guess. I walked up to his table and sat down. He looked up at me and, Hi, what do you want? You texted me. There was a brief pause. I got worried for a second. What, it's not him? But he broke the silence. Right, they follow you? No, I don't think so. He nodded. All right. And then he laughed. <laughs> like this was supposed to be funny. Man, you screwed up, didn't you? Hard to disagree with that. What were you doing anyways? What were you trying to find? Nothing. I swear. I just did it for the hell of it, I guess. He just stared at me in an amused disbelief. Oh, well that's fucking lame. Would have been cool if you were, like, a spy or something. He chuckled again. Look, who are you? How did... How did you know they were after me? Who are they, anyways? I pelted him with questions. Alright, settle down there. I'm not gonna tell you who they are. I don't know either. But I will tell you, they don't have good intentions. Fantastic, I thought. Well, how do you know about them? He paused. They came after me. One second, I'm reading about demons on the moon. The next, I'm getting my door kicked down. This was months ago. I skipped town. I was confused. Wait, what do you mean? They tried to kill me, dude. I couldn't believe this. And you were just viewing the links? That was it? You teach other people how to get there or something? He raised his eyebrow. No. Why do you ask? I was floored. They didn't do that to me, I said. They just came by, took my laptop, and gave me a warning. Now, it was his turn to look shocked. Really? He seemed to think about something for a while. He then proceeded to ask me what they looked like. Just men in suits, I responded. What did they ask you? Was his follow-up question. Again, I just told him. But then I remembered the last thing they said to me. They also asked me what my priorities were. Weird-ass question, I thought. His face went blank for a second. Yeah, yeah, strange, ain't it? What followed was an uncomfortable silence. I finally asked him the thing that had been on my mind ever since that night. That page with just four links. What the hell is it supposed to be? He raised his eyebrow and told me he didn't know what I was talking about. This is where things got really strange. After I told him a rough explanation of what I had saw, his expression changed completely. I could make out a sudden flare in his demeanor. What did you type at the prompt? He asked me. What also seeks me? I answered. I was thoroughly confused at this point. Isn't that what you did as well? He just shook his head. No. He then shut his laptop and then stood up. Well, where the hell are you going? I inquired. We've been here too long. Look, I know you have questions, but I can't answer them all for you. 
go to a motel tonight or something. And just like that, he was gone. What was I going to do? Stop him? I still have no idea who the hell this guy is. The only thing I got out of him was his name. Jackson. And even that's probably fake. Tired as hell, and still a little bit drunk, I left the diner and tried to stay hidden as I looked for a nearby motel. Obviously, this wasn't fun. Now, here I am, sitting in some sketchy motel at 4.30 in the morning. I can barely keep my eyes open, but I also can't help but look over my shoulder every second I'm awake. This is the pinnacle of my shitty situations. I guess I'll try and get some sleep. Nothing else I can do. I'll figure it out in the morning. Saturday. Well, I guess it's been Saturday for a while. Actually, it's 8 a.m. right now. Barely got any sleep. I have this creeping, ominous feeling in my gut as something that just isn't right. I turned on the TV. Anything to clear my mind for a bit. What I saw next did the opposite of that. It was a news report. A man strangled to death in a KFC bathroom. But the person murdered was one of the guys that came to my house and took my computer that night. No suspects. I just stared at the screen for the longest time. What the hell was going on? My phone suddenly buzzed. A different message from a private number. This is what it said. Go to the swimming pool on 5th Street, in the men's locker room. Go to locker 128. Combination is 12, 27, 33. Further instructions are in there. Do so before this text gets intercepted. Don't bring your phone. Of course. How stupid was I? My phone was still on me. Surely whoever was after me would have been able to track me. This never even crossed my mind. Out of curiosity, I peeked outside my window. Sure enough, the car that's been following me was now parked right there. Luckily for me, I caught my first glimpse of the driver and the passenger getting out. They were both wearing gloves and one was holding a briefcase. They're walking towards the entrance now. After I've emailed this to myself and a friend, I'm going to need to think quick. I've already dropped my phone in the toilet, and I'm going to need to get rid of this laptop next. But people need to know that this happened. If you hear from me again, looks like I found a way out of this. What a goddamn shit show this has been. Well, here I am again. I'm currently on a plane headed to Scottsdale, Arizona. I haven't actually been out of state in six years. I thought I would eventually, just didn't expect it to be under these circumstances. Anyways, let me back up a bit first. This is what happened. Right after I disposed of the laptop, I heard my lock being tampered with. Someone was trying to pick it. Now, I've never been great under pressure, so you can imagine how I was feeling. But the human mind is an interesting thing. When you think you're at the end of the line, your will to live really ramps up. The balcony, I thought. Only way out of this. Without hesitation, I ran out and climbed over it. Fortunately, I was on the second floor, so I didn't break my legs. Now came a decision. Run or hide? Both didn't seem too promising. Shit, I thought. I was panicking. That's when I spotted salvation. A cab parked on the other side of the lot. I bolted for it. I tapped on the window, startling the driver. Mr. Horvat? He asked. Well, no, it wasn't, but I nodded anyways. You said 8.40, didn't you? He looked at me in confusion. Finished early. Let's go. There was anxiousness in my voice, but I tried to hide it. Last thing I needed was for this guy to think I was a lunatic and drive off. I got in, told him the address, and we got out of there. As we left the lot, I looked back. 
two men I saw coming out of the car were now on the balcony where I just was. I could tell that there was a dead stare directed right at me behind their sunglasses. Despite all of this, relief washed over me. It was short-lived, however. I relayed the message I got in my head. Do so before this text gets intercepted. That meant I was still on the clock. If they don't know where I am headed yet, they will soon. We finally got to the place about 15 minutes later. As soon as I got in, I rushed into the locker room. It was mostly empty. I kept repeating the combination in my head. This was the only thing I had. I didn't really care about getting answers before, but it seemed like I had no choice now. I finally found the locker. Don't know why this guy chose such a massive place. 12 left, 27 right, 33 left. I swung it open. Sitting there was an older Blackberry model in an envelope. I opened it up to find a plane ticket, $2,000 cash, and a sticky note. In horrific penmanship, the words, check phone, password, snake tracks, were scrawled across it. I obliged and booted up the ancient device. I remember being slightly amused. I always begged my parents for one of these when I was a kid. This was a far cry from that. I took a quick look through the phone. It was mostly blank. No apps downloaded, no pictures, nothing. There was only one contact, bluntly named, call me. So I did. After just one ring, a voice answered. Who is this? Uh... Well, how the hell am I supposed to answer this? Should I say my name? I got your message, I finally responded. It was a brief pause. His response caught me off guard. What's your religious affiliation? His tone had gotten a lot more aggressive. Why the hell was he asking me this? I thought. I didn't even have enough energy to question him, though. Ray is protestant, but now agnostic, I guess, was my answer. He seemed to breathe a quick sigh of relief. Then he cut the line. Well, shit. Is this guy nuts or something? My thoughts were interrupted as I got a message. He'd sent me an address and a room number. Meet me. Was the only other thing he'd typed. I looked at it for a second before coming to my senses. I'm an idiot. I should have just taken the stuff and bolted. I heard the door to the locker room swing open. Then, footsteps coming down towards where I was. Sprinting, actually. I flipped shit. I shoved the stuff into my pockets and started looking for a way out. Again, there was really only one option here. I started making a break for the pool entrance. As I ran, fucking gunshots started ringing out behind me. I could tell they were using silencers. But boy, that doesn't do a whole lot when you're only 40 feet away. I suddenly felt a sharp pain in my side. I saw a bullet penetrate a locker right up ahead. God, that didn't miss by much. I ran faster than I thought I was ever able to. I almost slipped into the damn pool as I stumbled out. The lifeguard shouted after me as I burst out the emergency exit. I couldn't stop there. I hurried along, making turns every minute, looking over my shoulder the whole time. It's a good thing I was downtown. I blended into the sea of people easily. At one point, I saw a pair of policemen. I considered telling them I really did, but what's that gonna do? They'll search for those two guys, turn up with nothing, monitor my house for a couple of days, and then call everything off. It wasn't going to solve anything. I finally ducked into a hair salon. I just couldn't run anymore. The barber just looked at me like I was insane. Screw it, I thought. Might as well make myself less recognizable while I'm here. I got him to shave it all off. I spent the rest of the day making various purchases. A used laptop, new set of clothes, some bandages, 
and a pair of shades. At least something good came out of this. The flight was supposed to... The flight was supposed to leave in a couple of hours at this point. I called the cab and made my way there. And that's where I am now. I've got a long trip ahead of me still. Let's see what happens next. As I made my way out of the airport, I recoiled at the heat. God, it's November. How does anybody live here during the summer? I called another cab. Got to the address. It was a Holiday Inn. I laughed to myself. How ominous, I thought. I made my way up to the room and knocked on the door. A billion thoughts were running through my head. What if it was a trap? I actually thought about just running away for a second, but I realized that wouldn't accomplish shit. After about a minute, the door opened. A wave of surprise washed over me, but in retrospect, this is exactly who I should have been expecting. It was the other guy that came to my house that night. The one that didn't get strangled. He didn't look great, however. He had a black eye and a busted lip, and just looked tired in general. He looked me over before gesturing me in. He had a slight limp as he walked. Nice haircut, he muttered softly. He sat down on the bed, and I sat on the couch across from him. There was a long silence. The whole time, he just stared at the ground. To be honest, I didn't know what to say. So I said nothing. He finally spoke up. Might as well let you know what's going on. He then proceeded to let it all out. About four years ago, there was an incident in the Paris catacombs. I got chills after hearing this. Four teenagers decided it would be a good idea to wander off during a tour. I guess they got lost or something, because they weren't there at the end. The police pretty much swept everywhere. No sign of them. Eventually, the government decided to set up infrared cameras all around the place, just to see what would turn up. One day, one of the cameras picked up movement. Nobody anticipated what they were going to see next. It was hell manifested. An abomination of writhing limbs somehow stuck together squirmed across the screen. There were four human heads stuck to the top of this thing. You can guess who they were. I was beyond speechless. I thought about the video of the catacombs. I'm glad I didn't stick around for the grand reveal. He continued. They decided to send elite forces down there to exterminate it. Apparently, it took out 12 men before they put it down. Now, the question was, they were going to do this with the video. They couldn't get rid of it. But they didn't want anybody to see it either. And this was around the time the whole Snowden thing was going on. So they didn't feel comfortable with just using government servers. So this is where that website you saw comes into play. They got the most seasoned technical experts they had to bury it somewhere deep in the internet. And I'm talking about as deep as they could go. Nobody was supposed to know about it. Nobody was supposed to find it. And nobody was even supposed to know what to look for. I racked my brain over this. Sure, I knew my way around. But there was no way in hell that I was on par with the government experts. So how did I find it? He continued, and it worked well for a while. They made a pact with government worldwide. Anything they deemed unfit for public knowledge went on that site. There were even precautions. For every real thing on there, they posted four fake ones. For the select few that actually managed to find it. Wait, what? I couldn't believe this. He just chuckled. Yeah. Most of that stuff you saw was bullshit. Most. The videos are harder to fake. I didn't know how to feel about this. I was slightly relieved, I guess. Just slightly. He kept on. The logic behind this was that once people found these things, 
they'd look further into them. However, since they were fabricated, nothing would come up, and a page would be disintegrated. Just a gag site. At least, that was the idea. I knew where he was getting at. What about the people that started looking into the real things? He sighed. Look, nobody would have given a shit if they started spouting it off to their friends or on the internet. People would think they're crazy. It's the damn people that just have to go and find proof. The ones that plan to publicize it. Yeah, they get silenced. I was about to say something. I think he noticed because he cut me off. Look, don't put that moralistic shit on me. They didn't have to do it. It was their choice. They were committing a crime. Do you really think public knowledge about any of these things would help anybody? No, it wouldn't. Sometimes, ignorance is bliss, alright? To be honest, I had to agree. But here's where things really went to shit. He went on. Before, there would be maybe two breaches a month, and then it skyrocketed up to 20, and then 50. They looked into it. Apparently, there were rumors circulating around the deep and dark web. A rumor about a page that held secrets nobody was supposed to see. They decided to find out how easy it was to access this place, just from reading forums and shit. It took the experts about 20 minutes to find it, just by solving weird fucking riddles and then following these concealed links that would spam from them. And then, there was the final prompt. What do you seek? You've seen it, no? I nodded. Apparently, there's a lot of different answers that could work. Anyways, it didn't make any sense. Everybody that was supposed to know about this was grilled. Somebody had to be doing this, right? Nobody fessed up. Honestly, everybody seemed genuine when they said they didn't do it. They knew the consequences. After a brutally in-depth investigation, nothing was resolved, and then it hit them. Back in 2010, they had also finalized an experimental AI. I'll spare you the details, but it went off the rails. Nobody could control it. As soon as they thought they could corner it into a virtual trap, it just disappeared. It didn't come up again. Until now. He paused after that, like he was waiting for me to connect the dots. So, you think that this AI resurfaced and is now directing people there? I asked. He said that he doesn't think that's the case. He knows it. It's the only feasible explanation, he stated. But why? I don't know, he responded. I was starting to get a hunch now about why this was happening to me. These people, they aren't after me because I saw those links, are they? He just nodded. It's what I saw after. And you think this AI has something to do with it? Another nod. Well, what did I see? He took a second before speaking. I couldn't tell you. There's some things that I don't even know about. All I can tell you is that there are some groups, some people out there, beyond any government, that are after this kind of stuff, this forbidden knowledge. And somehow, they know you've seen it. And they want to know what you know. And they came after you as well? I asked. Yeah. They knew we talked to you. A wave of guilt came over me. Did, did I get that guy killed? However, that guilt quickly turned into frustration. Well, what the hell was I supposed to know? I don't know what the hell it was I saw. A dry chuckle came out of him. Well, they don't care, do they? They'll jump at anything. And who do you work for? The government? I finally asked. The question had been on my mind since I got here. Sort of. Was all he responded with. He got up 
taking out a pair of car keys. We gotta figure this out. We gotta go. Go where, I asked. Vegas. In any other situation, I would have been ecstatic. We went outside, and he led me to an older, beat-up sedan. Inconspicuous, he said with a smile. I could tell he was just trying to lighten the mood. The drive was so long and arduous, we barely spoke. My brain was fried at this point, so I didn't bother asking more questions. I did remember one peculiar conversation we had, though. Listen, if anything happens to me, there should be a file on the Blackberry named Contingency. Everything you need to know will be there. I remembered feeling flustered. What? What could happen to you? I responded. I don't know. Just in case, I guess. Don't lose that phone. In reality, I knew there were a lot of things that could happen. I just didn't want to admit it. He woke me up when we arrived at McCarran. I was confused. You have plane tickets? Don't need them, he responded. He got out of the car, and I followed him. What happened next was strange. He walked past everyone. The check-in, security, everybody. They didn't even pay attention to him. Not to me, either. That's when I started to wonder who the hell this guy really was. As we walked past the various stores and restaurants set up for near departures, he took a sharp turn. I stumbled, keeping up. He walked towards an unassuming door set up right between two shops. He swung it open, and I followed. We walked down a bunch of corridors, turning every so often. Various men in suits passed us, but didn't seem to acknowledge our presence. We finally got another door. We finally got to another door. This one required a keycard. He took one out and scanned it. I didn't realize how huge this place was until I thought about it after. We must have just passed at least 15 other hallways. Anyways, the door opened up to what looked like a long flight of stairs. We trekked down for about five minutes before I got to what looked like another terminal. Now, it didn't look futuristic or anything, just a regular damn terminal. Surely there's no planes taking off here, I asked. He said I was right. That's when I noticed the train tracks. Now we wait. And he sat down on a bench. Well, great. I'd given up trying to piece this together in my head, so I didn't even bother asking what this place was. Let's just see what happens, I thought. But as soon as I'd find out, things are just not that simple these days. I spotted a washroom sign towards the back and I headed for it. As I was washing my hands after finishing up, I noticed what looked like a card stuck into the side of the mirror. I plucked it out and looked at it. It was a standard business card size, just plain white with black text. And here's what it said. From far and wide, we search for meaning. As seconds pass since the time of weaning. Our destiny is sealed. We'll face the wrath. We don't need hope. We have our faith. We will not stop until we're dust. All for God in whom we trust. Creepy, I thought. And then I turned it over. In big, bold letters, it said F-O-T-L-G. No idea what that was supposed to be. However, in that moment, I felt that something just wasn't right. It's that creeping sensation you get when something just feels off. I needed to tell him, whoever the hell he is, about this. I opened the door, and he was gone. I searched around the terminal for a bit but he was nowhere to be found. Hell, there was nobody else here. The place just started rumbling slightly. The train was coming. Well, I sure as hell wasn't getting on it by myself. I looked around a bit more before I heard footsteps coming down the stairs. Great, I thought. He's back. 
Then I realized it wasn't just one pair of steps. There were multiple. Instead of seeing a familiar face, I was greeted with four of what I assumed to be men. I couldn't tell because their faces were covered with a burlap sack and had eye holes carved out. Kind of like the one Scarecrow wears in Batman Begins. The only difference was a symbol that seemed to be spray painted on where the forehead should be. It was simple, a vertical semicircle with angular arrows going through it. As I recall, the rest of their getup was normal, just plain street clothes. I was frozen, and then I realized that one of them had liquid dripping off his glove. Dark liquid. The next few moments were a blur. I remember the train pulling up and those guys starting to run towards me. I started bolting for the train. It was a weird one. Only one section and one set of doors. I don't think I saw a driver. As I ran up to it, the doors opened automatically. I remember frantically looking for a shutdown button, but there wasn't one. I just stared in horror as these freaks got in closer and closer. As they got within about 10 meters, I closed my eyes and just prayed for the best. I opened them when I heard kicking and banging at the door. It wasn't opening for them. I watched their crazed eyes follow me as the train started moving. I was safe, but only for now. I turned on the phone again and took a thorough look through it. Sure enough, the text file he mentioned was there. Guess I'll read it soon, after I'm done with this. Now, I don't know where I'm going, and I don't know what's waiting there for me. My head's pounding. All I know is that I should have just stayed on Google. I'm back. These are the events leading up to this point. I'm not so sure what to think anymore. I mean, it's not like anything was clear-cut before, but the world just continues to make less and less sense. I opened up the contingency file, and this is what it contained. Failsafe. Agent incapacitated. Alias, Jack Rust. Identity, redacted. Custom message. Hello there. If you are reading this, I suppose I'm out of commission. Shame, I guess. I'm not going to assume that We've at least made it to the terminal. Here's what you need to do. Get on the train. Do so as soon as here it comes. There's only a 10 second window where it'll open for anybody. Now, it's going to be the fifth. Count them. The fifth stop you'll need to get off. There won't be any announcements. No indications. Nothing. Do not fall asleep. Just pay attention. The train goes fast, but it'll take a while. Be patient. While you're in there, do not look out the windows. There's nothing to look at anyways. You'll be in a tunnel. Nevertheless, it's better that you refrain from doing so. You see, we've been having problems recently. Sometimes, something stares back at you, and you can't really look away. Now what I'm going to mention next isn't likely. I'd say it's a 1 in 1,000 chance, but you don't have the means to deal with it, so you'll need a heads up. If at any one of the stops you see or hear the door opening, hide under the seats. There shouldn't be anybody getting on right now. Just close your eyes and wait for them to leave. Now, if they're still there after the fourth stop, I'm sorry. Once you've arrived at the fifth, get out. It'll be another terminal. A very small one. There should be stairs to the right and a ladder to the left. Do not even think about going down the stairs. As you go up the ladder, it should start getting darker. Don't worry. This is what's supposed to happen. Keep feeling upwards. Eventually, you should touch something solid. It's a fake rock. Push it up and climb out. Put it back when you're done. You should be in a dead wheat field, this is Texas, between Crockett and Sutton County. To be specific, start looking around. There should be a small abandoned farmhouse visible a few miles in the distance. Go towards it. Once you've gone in, look for a basement. 
The place isn't big. You should find it easily. Once you have, go down there. Now the lights don't work, so it'll be dark. Turn the brightness up on the phone if you have to. You should be looking for a big red door. There's only one. So if you think you found it, you have. There's going to be a numerical set of buttons right by the handle. The password is 5325678. Now, this next part's a doozy. Not that you have to do anything crazy. It's just what I'm about to tell you. You see, the reason these people knew where to find you was because they went through us first. We'd been monitoring you ever since you started getting close to finding that page. I didn't tell you because, well, why would I? Apparently, there was a male informant in our midst. We believed that he was a member of a cult and that we thought went defunct a while ago. The faction of the Lost Gods. That's what they call themselves. I won't go into detail on them here. And I'll tell you that it is a lot. All I'll tell you is that they would go to the ends of the earth to find what you saw that day. That's their one and only objective. They aren't the only group seeking this. However, they're the only one that we're worried about. I guess once they started hearing about those riddles, they thought that this thing was trying to communicate with somebody. With them. Trying to lead them there. But this is the part that didn't make any sense. The thing that had stumped all of us. You were never supposed to see what you did. It wasn't supposed to be there. We have no clue why it was. One of the strangest things was that nobody had even created the page that it popped up on. We don't know how you found it. You were the first person that saw it since we took it off the site. This is where things got hairy for us. As soon as the informant noticed this, he called in a raid on our Texas headquarters. That's the one you're going to. It was a massacre. They stole our equipment and started tracking you down themselves. Luckily for me, I wasn't there for that. I was already on my way to you. Now, we don't work for the government. We work with them. But these politicians, they have a real antiquated code of ethics. A real antiquated idea of how to fix things. You see, those cult members aren't so easy to find. If they were, they would have been neutralized a long time ago. Because of that, their existence is a contingency protocol for this exact purpose. Blackout is what they call it. If they ever found out that this group had any chance of finding whatever it was that you saw, they'd put it into motion. Trust me, that's not going to be fun for anybody. They aren't willing to take any more risks. That's why we didn't tell them. Why we didn't tell most people in our own organization. They might spill the beans. However, if you're still reading this, that means desperate measures can wait. Once you've gone in, go directly straight until you've reached what looks like a control room. In the far right corner, there should be an older desktop mounted to the wall. Luckily, that's one of the few things they didn't take. Boot it up. It's going to prompt you for a password. Type in Primordial. A trap door should open up in the middle of the room. Walk down those steps and you should find yourself facing a bunch of file cabinets. Start searching through them. You're looking for a folder under the name Kane Hunter. He's he's an old friend. It's ordered alphabetically, so it shouldn't be that hard. That folder should contain his address. I understand that this is a lot of work for just one piece of information. However, this guy moves around so much, I just didn't bother keeping up. You need to go and find him. He'll have the answers that I don't. At this point, he's our best shot. Tell him Ben sent you. I'll leave you with this message. Mankind must not go back to hiding in fear. No one else will protect us, and we must stand up for ourselves. This government protocol 
is not the way to go. Good luck. That was the end of the message. This was a lot to take in, to say the least. But it sounded like I had a job to do. Luckily, nothing else got on the train with me. It took a while, but I finally got to the basement door in the farmhouse. As soon as I walked in, a wall of stench hit me. I reflexively gagged. A massacre. Those words rang through my head. I found a light switch on the wall and flicked it. As a stale, incandescent light washed over the place, I understood what he meant. It was a massacre indeed, and nobody was there to clean it up. Holding my breath, I stepped over the decaying, uniformed corpses. As much as I would try to avoid looking at them, I couldn't stop myself from glancing down every so often. I was about to pass out once I reached the control room. I followed the instructions and found the folder. As soon as I did, I got the hell out of there. Once I was back outside, I read through it. K-9 Hunter was 45 years old, and he lived in Hong Kong. Shit, I thought. I was starting to hate traveling. It took me a while to find a road. I eventually managed to hitchhike into a town. From there, I got another ride to Dallas-Fort Worth International. That's where I am right now. I'm tired beyond belief at this point, and it doesn't help that the back of my damn neck's itching like hell. The flight was long, so I got to contemplate the past week. There was a lot of unanswered questions still lingering, and I really didn't know what to expect from Kane Hunter. I remembered that train terminal. The card I found in the washroom? FOTLG? Faction of the Lost Gods. Shit. I finally arrived and cabbed to this guy's address. I was running low on funds at this point. During the drive, I watched as the glimmering lights of the city moved past me. On the surface, the world just seemed so straightforward. Guess it really starts unraveling when you look into it. I got dropped off in an unassuming apartment complex. I guess you could call it middle class. I buzzed his room number. It took a while, but somebody finally answered. Who's this? He sounded surprised, as if he wasn't used to visitors. I took a second to think about what I was going to say. Ben sent me. I need help, was my ultimate response. Almost instantly, I heard the front entrance unlock. Well, here we go. I thought. I started making my way up to the seventh floor. As I was about to knock on his door, it opened up. A rather unkempt middle-aged man pulled me into his room. Looking extremely anxious, he paced around as I took a seat. He finally stopped, turning to me. What do you mean you need help? His otherwise deep voice croaked as he said this. I knew that I was about to tell him something he didn't want to hear. I saw... I saw that thing. And now there's people after me. His facial expression contorted as he heard this. Who's after you? Who do you know? His speech was quick and discombobulated. The faction of the Lost Gods is what I think they're called, was my response. Now, his face went completely pale. They're back? I flinched as he cursed loudly right after. He sat down, burying his face into his hands. He looked back up at me. What happened to Ben? My silence was enough of an answer. He just nodded. He was a good guy. I just nodded back in response. I heard him mumble something under his breath, but I couldn't make it out. Now... It was time for me to ask the big question. The question that nobody seemed to have the answer to. What was it that I saw? He just stared at me for a few seconds, and then he finally spoke up. I used to work on a space station named Cronus One. You heard of it? No, I hadn't. And that's what I told him. Well, that's because you're not supposed to. Now, I really had no idea where this was going. He went on to tell me about how Cronus-1 used to be orbit space 1,500 kilometers away from the ISS. 
It was meant to be used for navigation and communications, he stated. That's what they told us, anyways. They were doing stuff up there for sure. Why else would they not tell the public it existed? Anyways, it didn't last long. One day, we got a message from NASA. It was a signal of sorts, coming from somewhere deep in space. Well, more like some kind of anomaly. Something that didn't make sense. They didn't elaborate on what that was supposed to mean. Anyways, they estimated that it came from beyond Cooper Belt. All of this was strange. Of course, they decided to check it out. He paused, letting off a quick sigh as he did so. They sent an interstellar probe towards the signal. It was estimated to reach there in about nine years. And it just so happens that about nine years later, I'm back up in space after taking a hiatus on Earth. While there, we get another message. The probe had reached where the signal had approximately been emanating from. They were going to transmit a feed for us to watch. I raised my eyebrows. He just chuckled at my confusion. Yeah, we've come a lot farther in terms of space technology than the public is led to believe. At this point, I don't think you should be surprised. Anyways, everybody's crowded around the monitors, waiting to see what the hell the probe picked up. Keep in mind that there were only ten people in that room at the time. It was too tight to fit more, so we were going to be the first ones aboard who would see it. The transmission eventually blinked onto the screen. He stopped, rubbing his temple as he did so. It almost seemed like it hurt him to think about. Everything went by quick. It only took a few seconds for the screaming to start. People were banging their damn heads on the floors and walls. It was chaos. Everybody lost their minds after seeing what was on that monitor. The only reason I survived was because I didn't actually get a glimpse of it. I was still in the bathroom when the transmission came through. I got out as soon as I heard the commotion. I still passed out though. I guess I'm not so good with blood. All I remember before hitting the floor was seeing a lone person still glued to the screen. He was the only one watching at this point. When I woke up, they started asking me questions. Wait, so what was the cause of death for them? I asked. Suicide. Mostly blunt force. He responded. Everybody in that room found a way to kill themselves. What the hell? I thought. Was this really what I had seen as well? So what happened to the other guy? The guy that you said was still watching. He passed out as well, but only for a minute. Other than that, he said he was fine. Never even really brought it up. When they'd asked him about what he'd seen, he'd just shrug and say that he didn't know what they were talking about. I knew him, actually. His name was Blake. He'd always been a strange guy. There was another pause. I kept trying to work this out in my head. Kane kept going. But that wasn't the end of his story. I perked up. He got fired soon after. He seemed to just stop caring about anything that was going on around him. He'd make these strange, dark outbursts every so often. And it would scare the hell out of everybody he worked with. He was going insane. After his last day, he went off the grid. His family, the few friends he had, none of them knew where he went or where he was going. There were no traces of him anywhere. But unbeknownst to everybody, he was going around the country, recruiting people into some cult that he'd created. You can guess what it was called. It didn't take long for me to put it together. The Faction of the Lost Gods. That's right, he continued. He'd even written and released a manifesto explaining why this was necessary. He'd go on about how there was something inherently wrong with the inner workings of our external world, and that we weren't even supposed to exist. Apparently, our system was corrupted. Whatever the hell that was supposed to mean. He was batshit, or maybe it was what he'd seen that made him that way. He went on to explain how Blake had been looking for something the whole time he'd been recruiting members. 
He'd been looking for the probe footage. You see, that probe was still there, transmitting whatever the hell that thing is to a feed that only the government had access to. I'll assume you've seen the site where all the sensitive knowledge goes. I nodded. Wouldn't be here if I didn't. At first, that's where they stuffed it, according to them. A few hackers banging their heads on keyboards every now and then wasn't that big of a deal. But after what happened on Kronos, almost nobody dared to look at it. And the few who tried, well, you know the story. But here's where things got incomprehensibly fucked. What I'm about to tell you, almost nobody knows about. This includes 99% of government agents. He took out a cigarette carton and lit one up. He took a long, heavy drag before continuing. After about six months, I went back to Kronos. They offered me a severance package just to retire and keep my mouth shut, but I decided against it. I was too cocky. I tried to pretend like what I saw didn't affect me. That shit was a mistake. He ashed his cigarette and lit another one. It was my routine work day. We were finishing up some maintenance when we heard a deep humming sound coming from somewhere outside the station. It wasn't like anything we'd ever heard before. Even now, I can't replicate what it sounded like in my head. It was just strange. A bunch of people started staring out of the windows just to see what was happening. I didn't join in. After the probe footage, my curious side pretty much disappeared. However, what happened next made me question what kind of universe we really lived in. I was eating lunch in the mess hall when I heard commotion coming from the hallway. I would have checked it out, but that's when the screaming started. It wasn't normal. Honestly, it didn't sound like anything that a human being should be able to produce. I remember looking at everybody else in the room. They weren't moving. We were all on the same page. A couple of guys actually barricaded the entrance with chairs. However, we couldn't keep our eyes off of it. There was some kind of light bleeding in from the cracks under and above the door. But something went wrong about it. The light wasn't any color we'd ever seen before. The familiarity of these descriptions got my mind racing. This was it, wasn't it? This is what I had saw, he continued. I remember getting lightheaded from just looking at it for a few seconds. The next hours were excruciating. The screams didn't stop. Our collective sanity was being pushed to the brink. We all just sat, fingers in our ears and eyes closed, waiting for the end of this shit. Eventually, the door opened up and we were escorted out. I remember looking around to see the white walls of the station now stained with red. 90% of the crew died that day. We had questions, of course, but what had happened? However, everybody that would have known was now dead. He leaned back in his chair, finished another cigarette out of the carton. This time, it was accompanied by a swig of whiskey. He went on. I arrived back on Earth shortly after. This time, he didn't offer me my job back, just a severance check and a non-disclosure, though it's not like I cared at this point. Would have quit regardless. Now, here's the connection to what you saw. That day, I was at my house, mulling over my life. Then I heard a knock at my door. It was Ben. He asked me what the hell had happened on Kronos. I told him. But the thing I didn't understand is how the hell he knew that something had even happened. He had never even worked with NASA, so I asked him about it. He said that a wave of distress calls came from the station. All came through at once. They all described exactly what I had gone through. The problem was, they had no means of dealing with this. It would have taken too long to organize a rescue mission. Everybody was at a loss for what to do. That's when the higher-ups came up with something off the cuff. They had a hunch. It was actually more of an experiment. They checked up on the website. Sure enough, it had been breached once again. 
somebody was viewing the probe footage. They tracked it down to an abandoned warehouse in San Antonio, which is where Ben was at the time. At the point, he was just a field agent, so they contacted and told him to go check it out. He drove there along with the SWAT team. When they arrived, it was a bloodbath. They started getting shot at as soon as they walked in. Whoever was doing it was trying to protect something. Half the team was killed before they managed to secure the place. But they detained the shooters and started sweeping the rest of the building. There was nothing on the upper floors. But then, they got to the basement. There was just one person down there, sitting in front of a computer monitor. They approached him slowly, barking at him to put his hands up. He ignored everything. The SWAT member eventually got close to him. That's when he started screaming out of nowhere and shot himself in the head. There's no doubt that he got a glimpse of the screen. Nobody approached him after that. They all just kept pointing their weapons at him and telling him to turn around. The guy eventually did. He said that it was Blake. Ben recognized him because he had become infamous around governmental circles. He said that there was blood seeping from his eyes and nose. Skin pale as the moon. He only said one thing. Kane stopped inside. He took a big swig of whiskey and looked at me dead center. You can't stop it. If this doesn't happen today, it'll happen eventually. Our reckoning has yet to come. Ben said that this chilled him to the bone. He told me that Blake had said it in such a tone and conviction that just made him feel despair and emptiness inside. He shot him right after that, as well as the monitor. They rounded up the rest of the cult members and took them into questioning. They wouldn't cooperate, obviously. They all just repeated the same words over and over. Some weird fucking motto or something. Anyways, the higher-ups got there a couple hours later. They congratulated Ben and told him to go home. The distress reports had finally stopped coming in from Kronos. Wait, I interjected. The reports? Did they stop as soon as Blake got shot? Kane chuckled. It was a dry one. No humor in it. Yeah, he continued. You're figuring it out, aren't you? Here's the conclusion they came to. Whatever that probe was picking up, whatever Blake was watching, it was watching him back. Somehow, they were communicating with each other. This was horrifying to think about, Kane continued. He was sending something towards Earth, something beyond our comprehension that we were never meant to see. Who the hell knows what it wants from us? Probably nothing good. Anyways, they decided to make sure that nobody else saw it again. They disconnected from the probe, stopped the stream altogether. I'm sure the thought process was that if we don't seek it out, then it won't notice us. Wait, what? I nearly shouted at him. How the hell did I see it then? That's what I was wondering, he said. You got an answer? I tried telling him about the AI, but the words just stumbled out of my mouth into an incoherent mess. He just looked at me in confusion. An AI? What the hell are you talking about? He asked. On that website, there was another prompt. It brought me there. That's how I found it. Prompts? What are you talking about? Screw it, I thought. He clearly didn't know about it. There was still too many questions pressing against my brain. Anyways, so I didn't linger on this. How many other people do you know that have seen it? How many other people do you know that have seen it? I asked. He scoffed. The ones that are alive? You. The scent chills down my spine. He went on. Which begs the question, how long did you look at it for? Just a couple of seconds, right? No, I responded. Nearly half a minute. After I said this, his face went blank. I just shrugged. Look, I... I don't... I don't know what to make of any of this, was all I managed to stammer out. With a shocked, contemplative expression on his face, the words from the contingency message rang through my head. You were the first one that had seen it since we took it down. But why me? Kane started speaking again. 
Computers may know more about humanity than we ever will. I just stared at him in confusion. What an odd statement to make, he went on. If it actually was an AI that sent you to that page, maybe it means something. Means something? Like what? I retorted. Nobody else seems to be able to handle seeing that thing. But like Blake, you appear to be an exception. I really thought about this. He was right, wasn't he? Whatever the hell this thing is, it seemed to push people to the brink of insanity after just a few seconds of exposure. I mean, I sure as hell didn't know what I saw, and I certainly didn't like seeing it. But I was more or less in a normal state of mind. However, there was one more question I couldn't ignore. Those members of the cult that were detained, they weren't the only ones, were they? There were other members. Kane nodded. They tried to tell themselves that they were it. That this was done. That's what everybody wanted to believe. Underestimating Blake's influence was the biggest mistake they could have made. At this point, I didn't want to think about it anymore. I needed a break from this discussion. I asked him if there was anywhere I could rest. He told me there was a spare mattress in the closet. I need to sleep, but not before I finish getting this out. A million thoughts are still running through my head as I write this. Ben said that this guy was our best shot, but nothing's been resolved. Hell, what was he supposed to do? Maybe this blackout contingency was necessary. If everything I've ever heard is true, it might be our only option. God, this itch on the back of my neck is killing me. Anyways, it looks like I'm going to have to make a decision soon. Edit. Kane and I just heard somebody trying to open the door. He took a look through the people and told me there were people with weird masks on standing outside. This is not good. You know how they say that time flies when you're having fun? Well, that also applies when you think you're about to be smoked. It didn't take long for them to break down the door. The thing is, jumping out of the windows wasn't an option here. I tried opening a vent in the washroom, but they were already inside the apartment. I remember seeing Kane fish a pistol out of the kitchen cabinet before getting bodied by someone behemoth of a man. This all happened in what felt like seconds. The last thing I saw before I blacked out was the butt of a rifle coming towards my face. I awoke some time later, the face down on a dusty floor in a dim, empty room. My head was pounding. I wasn't restrained, but there was nowhere to go. One door leading out, and it was dead bolted. I turned my head to see Kane pacing on the other side. Look, I didn't lead them here. I tried to reason with him. He looked pissed. Oh, I doubt that, he responded. Not on purpose, at least. They know that I can't help them. We've tried a while ago. He followed it up with a sigh. This is fucked. I turned away from him and started feeling around the walls. I was under the delusion that there would be some secret way out. A delusion it was. After my futile attempt at escape, I just sat down at a corner. There was no good ending to this, I thought. Kane seemed to read my mind because he chimed in. You know, you can't tell them how to get there. He looked at me again. This time, his demeanor was dead serious. You can't let that thing loose over here. That's not an option. Initially, I was annoyed. He was asking me to take what was surely torture than death. But then, I thought about it. This was bigger than me. There was no way out of it. The door suddenly swung open. About five people stepped in, all sporting those damn bags over their heads. Two had shotguns. You're awake. Good, said the one at the front. I instantly recognized that voice. Was it really? He slipped it off, revealing a big shit-eating grin. It was Jackson. It didn't have to be like this, you know. You could have just told me how to get there. I thought back to the conversation we had in the diner. 
I clearly told him what I had entered at the prompt. Did that not work for him? But I put that thought to the back of my head. At that moment, I was nothing but angry. Like it would have mattered. You psycho fucks would have ruined the world regardless. He just sighed. Ruin? Look, I don't expect you to understand. Only to cooperate. But this, this world, it isn't right. It was a mistake. So you just follow the orders of some crazy dead guy, huh? Kane laughed. It sounded like you guys are the mistakes. One of the men walked up and whipped the shotgun barrel across his face. There was a terrible cracking sound as he fell to the floor. He started coughing up blood. Why don't you guys just kill me? I can't help you. Wouldn't if I could. He muttered as he sat against the wall. Jackson chuckled. No, this is something we all need to see. The more people who stand witness, the better. It's the greatest salvation anybody could ask for. He was just bloviating nonsense at this point. I didn't feel like arguing. However, there was no changing his mind. I had questions, though. How'd you find me, huh? It doesn't make any sense. He walked over to me and reached behind my ear. I felt a sharp pain at the back of my neck as he pulled out what looked like a tiny computer chip. Oh, so that's what that was. I just let out an exasperated sigh. Funny enough, this wasn't our doing, he said as he flicked it away. What the hell are you talking about? I spat at him. But then I thought about it. When those guys were shooting at me in the locker room, I swear I felt something hit my neck. But in that moment, you just don't care. Jackson smiled as he saw the horror on my face. We can thank those guys for that. It's just a shame that they won't be here to see it. Everybody always resists. Only the lucky ones truly get it. I recalled Ben's message. A lot of groups are often this, but we're only afraid of one. Who were they? I asked him. Don't know, he replied. It never mattered anyways. I was reliving the whole journey in my head at this point, thinking about where I messed up. How'd you get to the terminal? You needed a key card. Jackson pulled one out of his pocket. Oh yeah, I forgot. They killed everybody who had one. I was beyond frustrated at this point. Not even just at him, at this whole damn situation. This thing that you wanted to send over here, do you even know what it is? He paused for a second. A look of pure contemplation was plastered across his face. I'll tell you what Blake told me. It's not for us to know. We don't belong here. And every second we remain, the universe deteriorates. We need to correct this. It's funny. These guys actually thought they were after something good. Blind faith, huh? I retorted. You guys are pathetic. Jackson scrunched his nose at this. His expression contorted into one of pure rage. That's enough! He gestured to two men standing beside him. They started dragging me out of the room. As we left, I could hear Kane screaming at me. Screaming that I couldn't give in. I tried wrestling the shotgun away, but it was a pathetic attempt. There was nothing I could do. They tossed me into another room. This time, it was larger. I guess the rest of the cult was also in there. Because about 15 people stood, lining the perimeter of the room. All with those bags over their heads. There was also a computer set up in the middle, wires running everywhere. They forced me into a chair in front of it and strapped my legs down. Go ahead. Jackson's voice echoed from behind me. Everybody's waiting. I refused at first. I really did. But I guess that's what they were expecting. First came the waterboarding. Don't know if you've experienced it, but it definitely wasn't pleasant. However, it also wasn't enough. What came next almost was, however. 
one of the men took out a butterfly knife and started slicing off my pinky toe, slowly. He did this over the course of what felt like an hour, and then came the salt. It was painful and transcended anything I've ever felt before. He finally finished up by cauterizing it. You have nine more. Jackson's voice oozed from behind me. You can end this any time. You can die the way you're supposed to. Hearing him say this just gave me more motivation to tell him to fuck off. But I'll admit it. I was nearing my breaking point. The next part was excruciating beyond belief. They started scraping the skin off my shoulder. It wouldn't have been as bad if it wasn't for the boiling water they poured on it afterwards. Okay, alright! I finally blurted it out. They stopped and started applying some cream to the burn. It was pure ecstasy. I heard Jackson breathe out what sounded like a sigh of relief. Smart guy. This was all a ruse, however. I just needed a break for a second. My plan was to get the prompt and then flip the damn table over. If they were going to torture me to death, I was going out with a bang. The human spirit is hard to break. A billion thoughts ran through my head as I went through the whole fucking process again. Memories of family and friends. Better times. I solved those riddles and encryptions until the damn question popped up again. Quid chorus. I was about to enact my spree of destruction when I noticed something. Something small in the corner of the monitor. It was hard to read, so I had to squint. It was the text. Just two words this time, in English. Don't worry. I just stared at it for a second. What the hell was it supposed to mean? That's when I came to a realization. I recalled what Ben had told Kane. It was only Blake sitting at that computer in the basement. He was the only one watching. Everybody who saw this thing went insane and killed themselves. Somehow, the AI also knew this. I smiled to myself. I felt somebody poke my back. Don't tell me you've changed your mind. We can change it back. Jackson's voice rung out. Don't worry, I responded. I answered the prompt question. What also seeks me? A familiar list of links soon appeared in front of me. I started scrolling down, clicking on various links until a familiar question appeared in the corner. I clicked yes, and just like that, there they were. The four links. I leaned back on the chair. Well, there it is. First link's the one you're looking for. I watched as they all gathered around me. This, the first time you're going to see it, I asked. I could see Jackson nodding out of the corner of my vision. Blake did make one mistake. He thought that we weren't ready. We were always ready. They unstrapped me from the chair. Jackson put his hand on my shoulder in appreciation. You don't know this, but you just did something good. Spare me, I responded. Is Ben still alive? I needed to know. Jackson nodded. Well, where is he? Why does it matter at this point? I just want to tell him to brace himself. I owe him that, at least. Jackson sighed. He took out a piece of paper with an address and postal code scribbled onto it and handed it to me. Good luck with that. He gestured to a couple of armed members. Follow him out in case he lied again. They obliged. I could barely hold in my grin as they walked me out. They closed the door behind me and trained their shotguns on me. There was only one thing I could do at this point. I just waited, listening intently. There was a few muffled voices before silence. I started counting. One. Two. Three. Four. And then came the screams. Even though I was expecting it, I still flinched. Cain was right. Those sounds should not have come out of a human being. The two guys guarding me flipped shit, 
One of them ran inside and the other stumbled on his feet. He was looking back and forth between me and the room, so I disarmed him easily and shot out his kneecaps. I guess he hit his head hard on the floor because he went limp. That's when the cacophony of gunshots started ringing out from inside the room. It lasted for about 10 seconds and was followed by silence. With a shotgun in hand, I walked inside. Bodies were lying haphazardly scattered around the room. Pieces of burlap sacks they were wearing were now stuck to the blood-stained walls. The monitor was face down on the floor. Shards of screen everywhere. There was only one squirming figure left. Jackson. Guess he really was dedicated to this. He was muttering something incomprehensible as he snaked his way towards a stray pistol. I thought about finishing the job for him, but that had just been putting him out of his misery. Instead, I went around the room and took the clips and shells out of every weapon. He gave me one last look before I left. His skin was paler than snow, arms and legs trembling. Expression, a mix of shock, dismay, and confusion. It looked as if he was pleading for something. I just flipped him off and closed the door behind me. This is what he wanted, wasn't it? I walked down to the room where Kane still was. I'd pick up the keys from one of the bodies. At this point, the cream on my shoulder as well as the adrenaline was wearing off. A wave of pain hit me at once. I stumbled a bit before I got to the door and unlocked it. Kane jumped when I walked in. He seemed relieved at first, and then horrified. Did, did you The words faltered out of his mouth. I just shook my head. He exhaled in silence. He wanted to take a quick peek inside the room before we left, just to make sure. Jackson was still in there, twitching violently in the corner, facing away from us. That was the last I ever saw of him. This'll be a pleasant surprise for somebody. This'll be a pleasant surprise for somebody, Kane said before closing the door. We got out of there after that. Turns out, we were in the basement of some abandoned factory outside city limits. We hitchhiked back to town. We got into Kane's apartment where he decided to buy me a plane ticket back. Least I could do, he stated. So where to? You said you were from Delaware? I looked down at the address in my hand. No, I need to go to Vegas first. Kane chuckled. Drinking away this whole experience, huh? Understandable. He started booking the ticket. Do you want to see him? I asked as I was finishing up. He raised his eyebrow. See who? Ben. He paused, staring at the ground for a second before answering. No, not really. He looked back at me. Tell him I wish him the best, though. Tell him to be careful. He said it in such a somber tone. I could tell he just wanted to be done with this whole thing. To never think about it again. Seeing Ben wouldn't help that. He gave me some cab money before we exchanged goodbyes. I had to ask him one last thing before leaving. You think that's the end of them? He thought about it for a second before answering. It has to be. I started heading for the airport. I gotta say, it feels weird walking around with a toe missing. I'll get used to it, I suppose. Once in Vegas, I took another cab to the address. It was a rundown house in the middle of a sketchy neighborhood. I hurried in and started searching. I must have looked through the entire place before hearing a soft groaning from the basement. I hurried down there and started yelling Ben's name. The groaning got louder. It was coming from a room in the back. I tried the handle. It was locked. I eventually just kicked it down. Dust blasted me in the face as I walked inside. Ben was lying there, on a dirty mattress in the middle of the room. He had bruises all over his face and looked like he hadn't eaten in days. There were packets of instant ramen strewn all over the floor. He turned over to look at me and smiled. I knew you could do it, he uttered out. I looked around the room. There was a small television set, 
smashed onto the floor. Yeah, they wanted me to watch it on the news. He grinned again, like hell I was. I picked him up and led him out of there. It's alright, I'm good, he said as he stabilized himself. Once we were outside, he took a deep breath. God, I don't even want to think about what I caught in that dusty ass room. I laughed. This shit was finally over, I thought. Ben got himself checked and patched up. I also got my shoulder looked at. We ended up hitting the slots, going to a seafood buffet and karaoke bar after that. It was the best time I've ever had in a while. I was getting ready to leave the morning after. Ben said that he had work to catch up on. Truth be told, so did I. I mean, it's not like my job would be waiting for me when I got back. You never actually told me who you worked for, or what you do. I said to him as we were getting ready to leave the hotel. He chuckled. Yeah, it was on purpose. Oh, come on. After all this, and you're still keeping it a secret. I gave him a casual nudge. After all this, and you still want to know more? He pushed me back. It was my turn to chuckle. Touché. The cab ride to McCarran was quiet. So was the walk to the terminal. I was headed back to Delaware, and he was going to South Korea. He finally spoke up about two minutes before his boarding call. I'd like to think that I do my best to try and protect the world from the strange shit that dwells within. To try and secure the stuff out there that humanity shouldn't ever see. To put them away in containment forever. He slapped my back before getting up to leave. Keep in touch, yeah? You know how to find me. And just like that, he was gone. I waited about 30 more minutes before my flight was ready to go. I slept like a baby the whole time I was in the air. When I actually got to my house, there was police tape surrounding it. I knocked on my neighbor's door to ask her what had happened. I mean, I already knew. But I had to feign some kind of ignorance. She seemed surprised when she opened up for me. Apparently, she saw two men entering my house and called the cops that night. I went to the diner. Everybody's been looking for you. Where the hell did you go? Uh, sightseeing, I answered. Did they catch them? No, she responded. But they found these weird-ass cards all around your house. It looks like FTLOG on the back or something. Who the hell... Who the hell were those nutcases? I chuckled to myself and thanked her. After explaining the situation to the cops and giving a statement, I was finally back at square one. Normalcy. I found a new job soon after and settled back into a routine. It was over, huh? But even though I try not to think about it anymore, it seems like a daunting task. Sometimes I lie in bed, just staring at the ceiling, trying to picture what I saw in my head. I still had too many questions. There were three other links, weren't there? What the hell were those? I tried to tell myself that I didn't care, but that was a lie. I think about what Kane said to me on a daily basis. You and Blake are the exceptions. Maybe it means something. Maybe it did mean something. I feel that sight calling to me constantly. I know that sounds strange, but I can sense it. Those links are just waiting to be seen by somebody. By me. The AI still tries to communicate as well. I've been getting small messages on the corner of my screen, even when I browse the surface web now. Are you satisfied? Is what they say. Good question. Was I? <laughs>